Before we start, I've been writing this down to make sure I do this. Hey, this is Connor Holloway from the Golden Hours Podcast. If you by chance get any sort of value, any sort of value, whether you learn something or you're entertained, you may even get a couple laughs, just share the podcast with a friend. That's all we ask. And then quick segue, before we introduce our guest, introduce yourself. What up, what up? It's Abu, aka Big Fresh. Checking in, big fresh. I just there's a sense of confidence when you're here. I'm like, okay, I know this is gonna run smooth. I just mm-hmm. know it. No, no one's more subtly confident than a boo. Uh, hi, this is Andy. This is my golden hour. Oh, oh God, what's going on? Where am I going? Oh. Dad? Yes, my son. I am Deuce, the Deer God. I'm so confused. Who am I? Derek. Your true name is Darkules. Darkules. Wait, what? Yes. You are Darkules, the god of the forest. <laughs> Season five. five. Hosted by your favorite podcast host, Big Bochi. You already know the deal, mother. What's up? <laughs> And then on my right, I, I ha- I'm a little bit biased because I, I went to his restaurant, but I had an incredible time, man. The staff, they all totally adore you. And I was like, you know, that, that's the mark of a wicked good dude <laughs> if your employees really like you. Because I've had some bad bosses, man. Yeah. Whoa. But I have Pitmaster, not Chef, Pitmaster Andy Husbands. Thank you for coming, man. Glad to be here. So before we had started, I actually think this is really interesting. We were talking about how nasty and like simplistic my meal prep is can you kind of explain what your like your diet i mean you're surrounded by food so like yeah but i mean actually actually before sorry can you just give a quick synopsis of who you are and what you do sure my name is andy husbands i am a uh, pit master some people call me a chef that's fine too of uh this i'm pit master and owner of the smoke shop barbecue we we have three locations right now we should be opening up two more coming I'm also an author of uh, five cookbooks. My sixth, sixth one drops in the spring. And I can already tell you're the ultimate hustler, man. You're a hard <laughs> worker. I just throw a lot of stuff against the wall. And, and so how long the first restaurant opened up when in Boston? 96? Well, my first restaurant, which I closed, I think, a year ago, opened in 96. I had it for about 21 years. So how old were you? I was 26 years old. So you were young and stunting. Yeah, so what? You, the, this podcast is uh, geared toward younger people, is that correct? Yes, sir. So you guys need to get off your asses and start working. Catch yeah. up. Come I've, on. I've, have you always had that motor? That like, let's go? Yeah. Sure. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, I, I don't know why I'm thinking about this, um, but uh, I, I dated a young lady. This was a while back, and... Um, she couldn't handle it. She couldn't hang. She was like, she was like, I'm, she's like, I'm, I'm thinking about doing, I'm thinking about doing something for her business. I don't want to reveal what she did. And I'm like, okay, let's do this. Here's the plan. This, 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 this. Okay, we'll do this. We'll call this guy. She's like, whoa, pump the brakes. And I'm like, yes, either we're, go. I'm like, either we're going to do it or we're not. Let's do this, you know. And um, not that every idea I've had uh, has been successful, which it has not. Um, but I just like to, I like to do things. I'm, you know, my father was an entre- entrepreneur. It's what I am. Um, and you just get out there and hustle it. What did he do? <laughs> this is why I know you need soundproofing. My father owned recording studios oh, no, <laughs> when man. I was a child, uh, punk rock clubs. This is the seventies and eighties. So punk rock clubs I had seen by the time I was 12, I had seen the Ramones, Blondie, Elvis Costello, uh, multiple times, um, at his clubs. Uh, he managed bands. Uh, so it was a wild upbringing. So are all the husbands kind of wired with that motor? Yes, but my mother was more consistent and my mother was more um, reserved. So uh, my sister and I both are um, kind of entrepreneurs, yet we are reserved in, um, in kind of how we approach it, more so than my father, who is just wild. Elaborate on what you mean reserved. Like you're a little more controlled chaos type? Yeah, fiscal responsible. Well, that's probably a perfect <laughs> formula for being a successful chef though, right? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's important to... To, to not just be creative and be out there, but also to understand, you know, what's the most important thing is your staff. And the most important thing is, is the people around you, um, the creativity, uh, making money, all those things will come, but you need to have strong people around you. That's like your one takeaway, like 
develop a, a super team. Yeah, build a team. And that's something I've always been good at. Uh, meeting people and kind of fitting them in my life in a way that works for me and my friends and my family and my, and my business. So one thing I noticed with myself as in a, a booze this way too, like we're both unlike a lot of people we're around where we have the need to constantly be doing and consuming. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like a dip in your, your mood when you're not moving or are you able to shut it off? Uh, I think when I was younger, yes, definitely. It would be like, what am I doing? Wasting time. Um, always was doing something. Now, uh, look, I'm a, I'm a new father. Uh, I have 18, Congrats. thank you, 18 month old twins, uh, girls, uh, who I love dearly as well, my wife and just shouts out to the wife. Yeah. Just being home, uh, with them is, 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 is enough. And how old are you? 50, 40? Mm, exactly. 50. So you're your first kids at 50. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. Was I 50 or 49? 49. No, I was 50. I was 50. Wow. My, my dad was 48. It was the yeah. same thing. Yeah. It's and it was, it's very interesting growing up with my dad. And he was much older. I got a much different perspective on like maturity because mm-hmm. my dad was already like sure ready to go like ball out. You yeah. know what I'm saying? You know, and also um, when I was 26, when I opened my first business and my second business and my third business, um, you know, that was all but before I was 30, and or right around there, um, and. You know, I was I was in at nine and out at ten or eleven, maybe having a few drinks after, um, and that was day in day out. So, I, had I become a father then, I'm not sure I had the mental capacity. I'm not sure I was mature enough to do that. And now, I have the mental capacity. I, I don't work like that anymore, and I'm able to be a very present father and husband, and that's that makes me very happy. Do you feel like? You know, your whole life, and usually we like elongate this to break it down, but do you feel like your whole life you've always wanted to excel at everything you've done now like you've reached fatherhood and it's like, okay, this is another job where I should like totally be the best? Yeah. I mean, it's it's just natural. It just feels like something that I want to do. And in, in life, I, oh, look, I'm fortunate. I do exactly what I want to do every minute of the day. That's fire. So, um but it's also, I'd like to get into that for a second, but I want to finish answering your question. So, you know, being a father, it's just exactly what I want to do. So I, I'm, I'm pretty good at the things I want to do. But what I'd like to say is, and people are like, well, Andy, you're lucky. You, you cook, you found your calling. It's not, it, it, it's a fun job, but it's still a job, right? To quote Cypress Hill. Um, and so what I encourage anybody to do is get right with it. There are things in my job that are difficult and challenging and brutal. And you know what you guys see of of chefs? You see the good stuff. But you you don't see me posting on Instagram the bad stuff. So, but I get right with it. So I actually have a project when I leave here that it's going to take me about an hour and a half. I won't tell you what it is, but it's not something I'm really necessarily looking forward to. But I'm like, okay, well, this is why I've got to do this. I'm right with it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to crush it because this is part of the game. So you have to just get right with whatever you're doing. And if right now, if you're in school and yet, and, and you're working at night and you're like, I don't want to work. It's like, yeah, but that's part of your life. So get right with it. That's kind of t- dial it back to your meal prep. Get right with it. So get you should get right with what you eat, and you're putting stuff in your body, dude. Wait, can you, I can I translate? Get yeah. right with it. It's pretty much you saying you got to be disciplined about the sucky shit too. Yeah, I mean that's one way to. I just get right. I'm like happy about it. Like whatever. This is cool. And I got to go do this, then I'm gonna go do it. Get that's, right with it. The Andy Husband's method. Yeah, just, stiff arm. You just it's like it's no. It's like do it. It's like people are like man, things this sucks, or I got to do this. It's like anytime you say. Uh, I should be doing something. You should think twice. Don't do it. It's like, I want to do this. You know, it's not like, Oh, I should be doing what X, what I have to do next. No, it's like, I'm going to do this. This is part of the game. You know, can you give a quick example of something that would be like really grueling for you to do like, and how you would get through it? Sure. Uh, um, you know, it's, we, we, everybody's familiar with, um, Yelp and Google. And yes, sir. all those reviews that come online, I personally respond to every Google and every um, Resi, that's who does our reservations, review. I personally respond to every single one. If you go on there and see I haven't responded to it, it means I just haven't got to it. But usually about every week I do this. I've been traveling so behind. Um, and it's hard. 
you know, it's it's the glowing ones are fun. Sure, you you're the best. We love you. Fantastic. I hey, right. Thank you. Super that chick, that ch- that pulled chicken was fire. Right. That's great. But when the other stuff is like, this isn't real barbecue, or our server did this, or we felt that's hard. It's hard to hear. You try hearing bad stuff about you. You know, it's tough, and I take it personally. But I love it. The way I get right with it is, I could be like. F them. I don't like what they're saying. They're not right. That's not who we are. Or I could go, well, that's their opinion. And this is how they feel. And I need to think about it. And I need to address it. And I need to see if there's any consistency in the complaints, which we have seen like certain issues that we've had to focus on. And then I respond to them and say, hey, man, you know, I'm sorry you had a bad time. We'd love to get you back in. And so that's not maybe not the best, the funnest thing to do, right? That's not, I know that's not a word, but, um, it's, but it's, it, you gotta go, well, this is part of it. And if you can't take the criticism, then, then you gotta get out of the game. And also being in the customer service industry, sometimes they'll leave something nasty and you have to be like, well, you're right. You're the best, which I'm sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you know, like uh, You've never stiff armed a customer who's just outright being kind of nasty. No, we try to we try to address it, but sometimes you know some, they're right for their for their opinion. They're right with their opinion. You know what I mean? Someone says your shirt's ugly. That's their opinion. What whether, are you saying, man? Well, I feel like it's form fitting. <laughs> but whether it's whether it's uh, whether it is or isn't, it's not. It's your opinion, not mine, that mm-hmm. matters. But again, people aren't paying to look at your shirt, so we need to. Uh, Look at those, and those those are that's where I try to get right with it. You know, it's like okay, well, this is important. It's important to have a dialogue with your customer. You know, you guys don't know this, but twenty years ago there was no internet. I mean, any of you know this, but there was no Yelp, there was no Google reviews, and people, um, you knew they didn't. You, the odds were that we learned this in school. If they liked it, they told three people, and if they didn't like it, they told seven people. But you never heard what they were saying. Now we get to hear it, and with the internet. It gets to be a little snarky. It's like stuff they would yell at a car window, you know, <laughs> never to my face. Yeah, and and people would feel more incentivized to right. share their opinion now. Yeah, and that's it, cool. Because they can just sit here and do it. Right, but I think that's cool. Like, I, I could go, I could be upset by this, or I can change my mind and look at it a different way, right? You know, I remember I was driving to the Cape one time, and the person in the car was like, I, I hate traffic, eh, and I'm so upset there's all this traffic. And I'm like, there's always traffic. And I'm like, so. It's a born bridge, dude. Well, let's just put some music on and just go slow. Like that's okay. Yeah. But then with that entrepreneur mode, are you like, Oh my God, I should no. get millions of things. Done. No, no, no. I'm good with all that stuff. I don't, I don't feel wasted time like that. That's silly. I just, uh, my entrepreneur mode is more, um, thought, you know, elaborate. It's not, it's not physical. It's thoughts, you know, I'm just thinking just... about stuff, you know, I wonder if I could do this. I wonder if I could do that. You know, how do I approach this? Okay, so quick segue back. So what, as a chef, mm. you're surrounded by food all the time. Yes. Excuse me, as a pit master. It's, it's fine. Pit master. Gotcha. It doesn't matter. I am both. <laughs> I love it. And so you, you, have the, you know what's healthy. You know what's not healthy. What do you personally fill your body with? Especially um, because you have to, your brain has to click as both a chef for a full day and a business owner. Sure. Well, I mean, I'm always eating barbecue, so you know this. I'm always taking a bite of ribs. I'm always taking a bu- trying the pulled pork, trying the brisket, trying the cornbread. That, that's part of, part of it. You have to sample your product. You should be listening to your podcast. You know, you got to listen to this stuff and you have to eat it. But in the morning, it's vegetables and a low-fat protein. For lunch, it's a salad with or without a low-fat protein or tofu. For dinner, um, usually tons of vegetables and another low-fat protein. That's generally what I eat every day. Elaborate on a low-fat protein for you. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of turkey tenderloins. They're my Whoa. favorite. So good. Better better than chicken. Um, and so do you, you pre- you're preparing these meals in your kitchen? or uh, Either usually at home, you know, at home. Or, or at, at work, it's going to be whatever I can find that's healthy. So a lot of salads. Um, but at home, when I'm cooking, yeah, I could probably cook at home three nights a week, maybe. So four, four maybe. So, yeah, I'm grilling. I love it. I mean, you know, I'm doing whatever I can do to eat good. Is there ever a moment where it's like you're so consumed by food, sometimes you just want someone to serve something for you? Or is it just really passion-based? Like, dude, I would love to cook my own food and cook my food in my restaurant. Yes. So I, um, 
I just came back from taping a TV show uh, for five days in Canada. Nice. And How'd it go? Went great. Thank you. It's called Fire Masters. I'm a judge on it. Let's go. And it's 15 hours every day. And they are supplying food for you. And you are cooking and you are around food. And it's constant food, 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 food. And when I got home, all I wanted to do is just relax and order some takeout. Like I didn't, I didn't want my wife to cook. I didn't want to cook. You know, I was just like, let's just get some food and just chill. So yeah, absolutely. Sometimes. What was your choice? Uh, we did some Thai food. And so are you critical every time you're ordering food though? Like from somebody else? Is it like, is it, for instance, I have a background in film and when I was really heavy in film, every time I'd watch a movie, it became an analysis, right? Yeah. It's like you're picking it apart. Are you doing that every time you're ordering food too? Um, maybe when I was younger, a little bit now, but not so much. I'm, I'm happy when someone's cooking for me and I'm happy to be like in a restaurant. Uh, but I do continually watch. I'm fascinated. You know, it's my industry. So, you know, I probably see things that you don't see. Um, as you would see things in a movie that I don't see. So, um, yeah, to some degree, but I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not critical. I'm not like walking in a restaurant and this is wrong and this is wrong. It's, you know, um, I'm old enough now to know that, uh, it's right for them. Whatever they're doing is, is the way they should be doing it. You know? So <clears throat> if, as someone who seems very focused on being productive, mm-hmm. Barbecue isn't necessarily the most cognitively inducing food. Sure. You know what I'm saying? I guess. Or am I wrong? I mean, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm also crazy about diet, but what I'm saying is like, if you're eating, there's sugars in the sauces sometimes. Do you ever feel like there's a perfect mapped out planned food for your cognition outside of your restaurant? For my personal cognition? Yeah. Like just being focused. Yeah. I've just been heavy on like refined carbs and learning about like sh- sugars and stuff. Sure. Those are things I don't give a thought to. Okay. If it, ta- if it tastes You know, good. so listen, I'm in the restaurant business. I'm in the serving people food. A barbecue is America's oldest cuisine. Uh, barbecue is a very traditional cuisine. So we're trying to honor the heritage. So, so uh, I agree that people should not, you know, maybe barbecue twice a week, maybe, maybe three. Um, you know, I know it's not the most healthiest cuisine, but, uh, that's not why people are going out. You know, people are going out for a lot of different reasons. Quiz, you know, health is part of it, but not always. I'm not demonizing the food at all. I'm just yeah. wondering. I know. I loved it. It was yeah. great. Yeah, no, it's good. So, you know, um, you know, we're, 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 that's not necessarily a, a, a thought for me or whatever. You know, I want to eat what makes me feel good. Uh, what makes me not get too fat. You know, and I just want to enjoy my life. So when you're marketing, because there's such a health conscious now, when you're marketing your restaurant mm-hmm. and the menus, mm-hmm. are you, when in your reinvigorating the menu, are mm-hmm. you constantly saying, okay, this is like a healthy, a healthy option I should provide mm-hmm. for the consumer? Yeah. So you are thinking for about how you approach it, which I appreciate. Uh, not everybody's um, health conscious forward. And that doesn't mean they're fat and lazy. That means just how you look at it isn't how everybody else is looking at it. So, look, we're a barbecue restaurant. So, that's what we serve. Uh, If people are looking for health-conscious foods, then they should go to a vegan restaurant. Why? I ate perfectly healthy at the restaurant. I did. I, 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 I know, but but so it's not necessarily. Look, we're we're a traditional restaurant, so mm-hmm. so health conscious isn't on the on the on the, on the forward. Mm-hmm. What we do, if if you want to talk about health, is all natural, no hormones, no antibiotics in our meats. And the people complain that we're expensive, and this is why because because you could go to you know your normal grocery store and see those meats, and then you can see their natural section. Then you can walk out of that place and go to Whole Foods, and you know and see what they sell. That's what we buy, and that's why it's expensive, you know, or a little more expensive. And so for us, th- that's really important to me. Um, try to move as much as we can closer to the farm. Um, so that's very important to me. Um, yeah, so you know, we want to make sure we have options for everybody. We do have a tofu on the menu. It's fried, but we do. Um, but we're 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 a barbecue restaurant, so you know, it's it's kind of like you're asking like a pizza guy. You know, it's like oh, let's sell pizza. Yeah, I feel you. Big fresh. Any questions right now? Um, <clears throat> so you mentioned like um, 
just kind of being traditional and kind of following like the roots of barbecue. Mm. Um, where do you draw the line between like following like the traditional model that's been there for centuries versus kind of innovating and adding new like tastes and textures to the menu? That's a great question. Well, barbecue is very personal and, mm-hmm. and you know, I have a lot of conversations, as I said, with a lot of customers and a guy from Texas could be like, well, what you're doing is not barbecue. And I'm like, that's true. And if I did what you want me to do, then the guy from Kansas city is going to say it's not barbecue. So it's very personal barbecue. Um, but, you know, I like to call it my stuff City Q. So bar- barbecue is a, is a cuisine out of um, necessity. That's how it was created. You know, it's hard to imagine, but, you know, 100 years ago, there was no refrigeration, right? 200 years ago, no refrigeration. It's pretty wild. So they had these pieces of meat that were fetid or old or not, you know, not fresh, I should say. And they gave them to the slaves. They gave them to the sharecroppers. Here, you can have the ribs. You can have the shoulder. Nobody wants that. They wanted to eat the, you know, the, the tenderloin, the, the, you know. So very smart. They take it. They throw it over a fire. Go work the land 14 hours. Come back. And now we got pulled pork, right? Maybe a little vinegar. Maybe a little hot peppers. And we're good. So it's a, it's a cuisine out of necessity. And so I love the tradition and history of it. But as you can tell, I'm not from the South. Um, I've been doing barbecue for 20 years, and so I've practiced and practiced and practiced. Um, it's not just something I decided to do one day. Um, so, you know, what we try to do is I try to kind of do my version, my tribute. Listen, I can, I can make kimchi. I can, I can make really good kimchi. Big Fresh is big on the kimchi. I love so kimchi, I can make yeah. kimchi, right? Go to the right rea- reliable market right around the corner. I love mm-hmm. that place. Uh, I can make it, okay? But I'm never going to tell you it's traditional. It's pretty obvious I'm not Korean. So <laughs> it's, it's my, my version, mm-hmm. but I bet if I gave it to, you know, someone who's Korean, you know, and who grew up making it, they'd be like, yeah, you know, my grandma makes it better. I'm like, I'm, I bet, you know, I'm not trying to beat your grandma. So the same thing in our barbecue, we're not trying to be the best. We're not trying to replace your, 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 your childhood memories. That's kind of the fond memory reaction. We call it. And I don't want sitting on your grandpa's lap, eating barbecue. That was the best you've ever had. You keep that memory. If I could be a close second, I'd be pretty happy. So when you're starting up your restaurants and you're branding your restaurants on a, on a marketing level, you're thinking of how to create the most comfortable and inducing experience. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of talk about that process? Like how you chose the aesthetic kind of the restaurant? Well, barbecue restaurants look a certain way, but we didn't want to be a roadhouse. We didn't want to have peanut shells all over the place. Uh, We knew we wanted to have an extensive uh, whiskey, American whiskey program. We have over 240 American whiskey labels. Yeah, you guys got to go in. It's the most elaborate backing of the bar. There's like a million bottles. Yeah. So, you know, to do that, you know, you need to, I think you need some kind of certain experience. You know, if you just want to serve shots of Jack, you can just have a little, you know, a little takeout, which I love those too, you know. So we were looking for a place that was comfortable, uh, fit into Boston, but yet still fit, fit the theme of barbecue and, and honor that tradition. So lots of, um, <clears throat> you know, wood feels and um, it's comfortable TVs because we love sports. So just a fun, good place. That <coughs> excuse me. We just want people to be able to kind of come in and feel feel welcome and, and enjoy. I did. <laughs> I'm sorry, was it Dan or Dave? Dan. Dan. Shout out to Dan. You did a great job, man. <laughs> So, quick rewind. So, when you're 26, 27, fire up your first spot. Mm. Your the cuisine was mostly it varied, but it was a lot of American cuisine, right? We called it adventurous American, but really just to be a good American bistro kind of. For me, it was like a kid in a candy store. I could order whatever I wanted and make whatever I wanted. I always try to stay. Um, kind of tribute again to like, I love to cook different cuisines. So you could see some Mexican, you could see some Hawaiian, you could see some Thai, you could see Japanese, you could see French, but never traditional, whatever you were feeling. Kind yeah. Of. Whatever I was feeling, whatever the, whatever the, 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 the products, the vegetables spoke to me, you know, um, you know, coming up on pumpkin season. So I'd be doing pumpkin and potatoes. Right. And so each season kind of led to a different thing, right? Spring is asparagus. So, doing all that it was fun so did you when you start shifting into barbecue were you bored of just doing the old stuff you're like all right i want to try a new venture well writing a writing a menu is like writing a symphony yeah i'm actually know? totally fascinated so, how you do it so it's uh that was um you know it was, it was you know always a challenge writing new menus um 
but uh, I, you know, I wasn't say I was bored. I just, you know, you know, you try doing something for twenty years straight. It's hard every day. Yeah. So I loved it. I loved the South End. I loved that business. I loved my customers. When we were closing, they all kept coming back. Ones we hadn't seen for years. It was so great. So many people were like, oh, we got engaged here. We met here. And, you know, we had our birthdays here. And I just loved that. I mean, that's all I have ever wanted. And um, so, but I had done it for 20 years. And I, I was ready for something new. And, um, you know, a lot of times you see people in the business world, they may work at a place, you know, for 10 years, you know, from 40 to 50. And then they, they become from the, you know, whatever, you know, a vice president to the president, you know, to become the CEO or something. So it's kind of what I wanted to do was, it was do something. And I, I partnered with this gentleman named Brian Lesser. Shout out to Brian. Brian's the best. Um, and you know, we talked, we met, we'd known each other, but we were talking like about doing something together and what would it be? And we we're actually looking at other concepts and this, he's like, why aren't we doing barbecue? And I'm like, so just to, just so you know, unless you know, uh, I'm a member of a barbecue team called IQ. We're led by a gentleman named Chris Hart, who's my best friend. They just won a big award. Hmm? You just won the big award, right? The 2018 Jack Daniels. Not 2018. 17. Not even close. Uh, okay. 2009. But okay, um, but we were the first non-Southern team to win the World Championships of Barbecue. So that was kind of, and that took a long time, years and years and years of practice um, and to developing what we were going to do. But so barbecue had been my passion. It had been my golf. It's like a weekend of barbecues, you know, weekend with your buddies cooking. It's fun. And so Brian's like, why aren't we doing barbecue? And I'm like, ah, I don't know. Let me think about that one for a couple of days. Really wanted to make sure whatever I did next, I had actually thought about. Um, the first business I didn't really think about. I'm like, sure, I'm going to open a restaurant. And of course it'll be successful. No one ever told me different. So, so I thought about it and I'm like, yeah, this, this felt right to me. It felt like something I wanted to do and something I knew I was good at. So just, uh, you know, we went, we went for it, opened up one and then we opened up three within uh, three years and now opening up two more. How do you assess that? Like, okay, now it's time to expand into a second location. Cause I feel, I mean, you were stuck with the first one for 20 years. Not stuck, but now you're grown like wicked quick. Are you just like, okay, this seems like a good spot. Assembly row seems like a pretty mar- high traffic marketable area. Mm. No. So, I mean, first of all, you, you know, we opened up one and we had to get it right. That took a, that took the longest one to get right. What we really had to do is listen to the customer and see what, see what they wanted. The original menu was entirely different and, um, not entirely, but barbecue was a part of it, but there was other stuff, steaks and seafood, and the customers basically didn't order it, so we knew, they were telling us, don't even put that on the menu, so we were able to kind of hone and figure it out. Then we, with with with, with the smoke shop, we 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 went into this knowing we were gonna go, go multiple units, so we hired branders, you know, we hired, you know, people to do design for us, help us kind of look at a feel and a design that would be rep, rep, replicable, replicable, God, I'm not going to say that. Replicable? Yes, thank you. Is that right? Yes. And then uh, as opposed to Tremont 647, my first restaurant, first of all, that's the location, so it's kind of hard to name something else, Tremont 647. Uh, and I didn't know anything about branding when I opened that place. Uh, I didn't know anything about multiple units, nor did I even want to do that. You wanted your spot. Yeah. Kind of like, like a little studio in the back of a random warehouse. You just wanted your thing. I wanted my thing, and you know, I wanted to, I wanted to cook. So for you, it was the, cause this is a big bind. I'm starting to notice we have a later in the week, we have someone who runs a big meal prep company coming up too. And was for you, was it food first? Then you learned the business as you went or was it business first? Learn the food. So, um, as I told you, my father was an entrepreneur. So business, business, business. And so I got a lot of that from him and I was fortunate enough to work at the East coast grill in the early 90s. It's no longer here, but it had been around for 25 years. Where, right? where was that? Inman yeah. Square. It's where Highland Fried is now. No way. Um, you know, it, it's Highland Fried, like, it has this really sh- distinct aesthetic. Colors and stuff. Yeah, yeah, very. Inman has these great restaurants. Yeah. So it used to be East Coast Grill. And my mentor, Chris Lessinger, is a phenomenal chef. Um, but he might be a better businessman. And I'm not sure. I mean, he's a great chef. And so he, I was lucky enough to have somebody who cared about me, who taught me not only how to be a, a, a better better cook and a better chef, but taught me how to be a be a man, how to be a, and I don't mean that 
in a man versus woman, but I should say to be a good person and to be a good manager. And he taught me numbers, 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 numbers. It doesn't matter how good your food is. If your numbers aren't working, you know, then you're, uh, you're, you're out of business. Yeah. You're having a problem. So, cause this is a business, right? It's a business. And, you know, customers see the good stuff, you know, service is the, is the fun, easy part, right? It's the other stuff that's harder. So you don't like the accounting end of restaurants because I feel like you have to be so meticulous. No, I love it. I, I took I took accounting for four years in college. I freaking love it. I love accounting. Uh, I wouldn't want to be a CPA, but I love the numbers. Oh, and my God. so exciting. We were cool until you said that, man. <laughs> I love accounting. Good it's, God. Yeah, but that's you need to understand that stuff. For sure. You know what I mean? Didn't, look, didn't look you at all these, look at uh, Yeah. Look at all these... Um, I don't know. Let's just say a sports guy who doesn't, who makes all this money and then ends up broke. It's like, understand your game. Understand it's about money, right? We live in a capitalistic society, right? You yeah. got to make some bread. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not like money focused, but look, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. You know, uh, uh, I have a responsibility to 200 people to pay their rent every, every month. 200 employees? Yeah. Let's go, Andy. So, Come on, brother. And they, they have to pay their rent. They have to, right? Mm -hmm. As do I. But like, they have to pay their rent. Without staff, you're nothing. So you need the staff, and you need them happy, and they've got to pay able to pay their rent. So you have to understand numbers because if you don't, how are you going to pay them? Is that a is that a constant uh, anxiety for you? Like I, I'm responsible for hundreds of people because a lot of people <clears throat> think high positions in business can be glamorous. But I'm starting to learn. It's like, dude, if you want to be a good leader, you're serving. Hundreds, maybe even thousands yeah, of people. Yeah. In the beginning, I thought it was like, how, you know, when I first opened my first restaurant, how can I be creative? How am I going to be able to do this year after year? How am I going to pay rent? Um, worried about like liquor license infractions. Those are my big concerns. And then at some point, like a half a year in, I was like, oh, I don't care about that stuff. I care about my team. That's what I care about, that they're, they're happy because you could see when people were happy. You could see when they were doing well that how proud they were and that was the most important and most rewarding stuff big fresh uh i have a question that's like a two-parter I, I have this like this sixth sense i know when you <laughs> got a big haymaker waiting so go ahead so um say you're 25 26 and you want to start a restaurant and you have this idea mm. but you know at that age you might not have like the capital to kind of fund all that so mm -hmm. From your experience, how did you kind of fund your first business idea, and would you do anything differently now looking back at it? <laughs> One yeah. sec. Incredible question, man. That's your two for two today, I've been bro. Thinking, I've been You're thinking about it. it. So, yeah, yeah it's just, you know, I was pretty well known by the time I'd opened that. I'd been on a cover of a couple of magazines. Um, there weren't as many restaurants, so there wasn't as much noise out there. There's so many restaurants and stuff. Also, there wasn't that many um, ways to get the word out. So if you could get in Boston Magazine, if you could get in the Globe, uh, you were, you know, or in proper Bostonian, you were pretty well known. And, and I was well known as a good chef. You were hanging with Jasper. You, you guys were like the rat pack. I wasn't, I wasn't with Jasper then. I, I, I got to meet Jasper later and we became friends later. Shouts out to um, Jasper. Jasper White. Miss you, man. You're a great guy. So, um, you know, we, we hustled it. My, my, my business partner and I, that's Chris Hart, who uh, uh, at the time was my business partner, uh, who was on. We're on barbecue team together. We both had about five thousand dollars to our name. Um, we hustled that money. Anybody I knew, if I knew knew you, I would ask you, "Can you lend me a thousand? Can you lend me five thousand? We did not sell any equity. I built myself a team of advisors, uh, a guy named Michael Staub, who's like a restaurant consultant, uh, helps you kind of open restaurants, helps you put the business plan together. Um, you know, I had an architect ready to go, a CPA ready to go, lawyer. Um, you kind of build yourself a team, and then you go and just raise the money. The funny part is, and this, you know, I, I don't know how do you do it now. You got to hustle it. You got to get there. Mm -hmm. Use the use the professionals. I really, you know, you must use the professionals. The bank gave us a hundred thousand dollar loan, which wouldn't happen today, but somehow they gave us a hundred thousand dollar loan. Do you have any credit? Yeah, I mean, I had very good credit. But that didn't matter. I had no assets. They're not going to give you anything without assets. Uh, if you can leverage it, use you know some property or something, maybe your parents. But you know it's risky. It's risky. Uh, you know if I was to do something over a couple of things. One is you know we started construction halfway when we had half the money, and about halfway through construction we ran out of money, and they, mm -hmm. they shut it down. 
and I'm like, hmm, I'm going to lose this project and I'll have never opened my restaurant and I'm going to owe whatever, 175000 That's because it cost three fifty total. But then we got the bank loan and we got a bridge loan from somebody until the bank loan came. And, uh, you know, lucky enough, we were able to do this. You know, were you pumped when that second loan came in? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, in retrospect, you know, look, I, I, it probably would have behooved me to work a couple more years, four or five more years um, for other people learning more. You really need to know a lot. And so I made lots of mistakes um, and could have been, you know, I think um, a better manager, um, more better f- uh, financial manager had I learned more. You know, when you're young, you think you kind of know it all. And as you get older, you realize you don't. Mm-hmm. So so I would, you know, that's probably what I changed. But again, look at me. You know, I, I did all right, you know. Um, so I'm not a regretter. I, you know, I look back at it and like this is how life was and what I did and I'm okay. Well, you're on that balls to the walls mentality. It usually works, doesn't it? No. It doesn't. I know plenty of people. You know, okay, well. <laughs> I know plenty of people who open businesses, and I don't mean just restaurants and they fail. I know plenty of people. So had had you known about the, well, didn't you have a two-part question, or is that? The second part was kind of like, what would you do differently? Oh, okay, yeah. cool. Got it. Yeah, so getting into the restaurant business, you always knew it was wicked competitive, correct? Yeah. yeah. You, you went to Jaywoo? Yes. All right, I need your top five favorite Providence restaurants, or three. <laughs> Oh, I haven't been in Providence in a while. So. Oh, you stay out of that neck of the woods. <laughs> uh, no, I got nothing to say about Providence. W- was Thayer Street prevalent when you? Yeah, were it was. Going- it was kind of cool. It was a club I used to go to called the Rocket. Whoa. I freaking loved it. So punk rock. That was so on awesome. Thayer Street. No, man, that was. I don't even know what street that was on. But. Right downtown. Yeah, it was awesome. And then it became Club Babyhead, and that was fun too. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it was probably right near the Jaywood campus, right? Uh, downtown campus, not yeah. the culinary campus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I threw an event, I think, like right in that same venue. Mm-hmm. But um, why have is, is there a restaurant market in Providence? Have you ever thought of expanding over there? Maybe I had a restaurant in Providence. You closed it. Mm-hmm. So was the market bad or I don't know. I, you know, I don't understand Providence. I, personally, I had the best time in college ever. Going to college in Providence was like you know, college was crazy fun. I loved it. Um, but for a restaurant thing, it just didn't work for us. And I'm not exactly sure why, but I will tell you, I've had two restaurants fail. And the hardest part about it is to look in the mirror and go, it failed, failed because of you. And so I take full responsibility for it. And I certainly did financially. Um, and that is um, when your restaurant's not doing well or when your business is not doing well and you're in charge, look in the mirror and go, I'm the one. It's my fault. Yeah, yeah. People want to blame everybody else. Oh, it's, you know, if this was in New York, it would be successful. If, uh, you know, if this happened, I'd be successful. People don't understand me. Like your job is to make something and sell it. Right. And if the customer isn't buying it, then why? If they're not returning, they'll check you out once. If they're not returning, then why? It's because of you and your decisions. Accountability. You could, you could blame people that work for you, but you hired them. And even if you didn't hire them, you hired the person that hired them. So you got to own that. It's intense. I own, I own, that's why they're back to those reviews. I own every single one. I don't be like, oh, you know, my pit master, you know, he was sick that day. No, that's my fault. It's always my fault. And I'll take it. Because you know why? Because I'll take the good ones too. Have you always been wicked competitive? Yeah. Oh, yeah. My family's crazy competitive. We used to, we used to just play Monopoly and Hearts and just always competitive. Yeah. You need it though, right? What? To be in your business and be successful. Uh, I don't think so. I know lots of guys who aren't, aren't crazy competitive. And, and to be clear, I'm not competitive against any of the restaurants in, in Boston or anywhere. I, I, competition's natural. You want competition. I think it makes us all better. It's like if we only had the Red Sox. Well, then what are they doing, right? You need other teams to be out there, right? So the Patriots be killing it. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's just, um, you know, so you know, I don't, I don't. I don't, I, I, I like the competition. It's important. I want good restaurants next to me that bring in more people. And, you know, I want them, not everyone's going to eat barbecue every night. So let them go to Pammy's one night. I love Pammy's. So you know, there's all different restaurants. Let them, let them do that, you know. But being a barbecue restaurant in Boston, there mm. aren't many main competitors, right? It's kind no, of a specific niche. It's no, Sweet, Cheeks. Sweet Cheeks is awesome. Red Bones, old school, Blue Ribbon. Those guys are cool. So like there's some good stuff out there. Let's say for the Seaport location specific, though, the people at Sportello aren't really taking clientele from you, correct? 
I mean, not clientele consumers. Well, the way you look at it, if you ever do like a SWOT analysis, is anybody who is serving food is your competitor, right? That would be a threat. So anybody, that's Seven Eleven, that's everything. So they do. People do make those choices. Oh, I wanted to go to the smoke shop. But, uh, they're going to be busy at lunch. I'm just going to go to uh, Blue Dragon this, or, or this deli or Stop and Shop or wherever, and I'm going to get myself something quick. I mean, everybody, you compete against everybody. But I don't do that in a in a negative way, and I don't do that in a like I I want to crush them. I, I don't care. Like I, they, look, the customer decides. The customer decides if that business is good or not. I don't decide. The customer decides. Consumer first. Yeah. So at, I'm starting to learn. At what point do you realize, as a chef, you have to develop like a really pop and brand for yourself to help drive sales for your restaurant? Because I feel like that's, there's a gold standard. Like everyone wants to be like have a TV show and mm. get to that point. Yeah, but there's you know that's why there's always going to be someone stronger than you, always somebody richer than you. So I don't know what. <laughs> look, I, I, the way I know I'm doing good is my staff is happy. Uh, we're, we're we we have investors. Our investors are happy, and I'm happy. That's how I know things are good. No, I mean, as a chef, you. People want to know who's serving the food in their restaurants, correct? Yep. Usually. So at what point were you like, okay, I, I got to learn how to market myself a little bit. I got to learn how to sell myself. Uh, I've been, that, that's no problem. It's I've, easy. I've been doing that forever. It's that's natural. If, if I was not to do this, I'd be a marketer. I love marketing. I love coming up with ideas and concepts and love just rolling them out and seeing how they play. So absolutely. We, you know, we just rolled out our, our marketing plan for, uh, uh, 1920 so end of 1920s we go from fall to fall and um we have events every month something going on we're out there doing stuff and for us that's fun you know and it, 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 a lot of places don't do that a lot of places just day in day out dinner and that's what they like to do i like to do you know excuse me i like to do classes so i teach i teach a lot of barbecue classes we do bourbon tastings we do um guest chefs we do all sorts of stuff just to have fun for us it's exciting challenging so this is probably gonna be our content question sammy sutherland when you cut this up so let's say someone our age right 23 24 25 26 they want to get into the restaurant business mm. they don't necessarily have the culinary background but yes. they, they know they like the business what advice would you give them if they don't really know how to cook they don't understand food but they do like the business end what, how do how do they know they like the business? Are they have they been in the business, or they're just fascinated by it? It's glamorous to them. <laughs> Good, I love it. We need more people, especially if they're smart. So bring them on. What I would suggest you do is reach find you find a restaurant you like and go go hang out there. Offer your time for free for about I don't know a week, two weeks, and just stand. Can you stand for fourteen hours? That's my question. That's how you get those meaty calves, yeah, baby boy. Uh, twelve. Dude's got rocket calves. Twelve. I have like double muscles. You can. Dude, see what the hell down. are those things? Um, so, um, what I would I suggest is um, go work. Just you know, you don't even need to do it for free. Just go get a job. Go get a job. Bussing tables, and you know, if you're smart, they're going to advance you. Wait tables. You know, if you want to cook, cook. You don't need to be in the culinary industry. But if you, whatever you want to do, jump in, you know, head first. So, you know, just maybe they don't understand how food is cooked, but they need to understand it if they want to own a business. So either work in a kitchen or start reading. I mean, you guys have YouTube. You can watch videos and learn about food, learn about what you're passionate about. Maybe get your sommelier, um, you know, do whatever it is just to learn. I mean, I don't care what. So, uh Vince Wilfork, right? Big dude. Vince Wilfork is a big, giant dude, right? So I'm at the airport. One of the, one of the best guys, right? Like, that's the nicest guy. One of the best guys I ever played, in my opinion, right? He was phenomenal. So big, strong guy. Well, that's nice that he's a big, strong guy. There's a lot of big, strong guys out there. And in fact, there's a lot of bigger, stronger guys. So why him? Because he was super smart. What you get paid for is not your back, not your strength, but your mind knowledge trumps everything. We will pay you more for the more you know. And that is pretty much anywhere. And you will advance for the more you know. So you can go out with your friends every night, party it up, and you still could be successful. Or if you want to maybe add a couple feathers to your cap, maybe spend a couple nights home and read and research. That's what I did all the time. Always reading, always researching, always learning. Always. 
How, was it tough for you to turn off the restaurant switch when it was growing, when you'd be away from the restaurant, or are you always thinking about it? How do you personally improve when you're so consumed with your business? Well, I mean, I'm always doing something. So I just wrote another cookbook. So I'm researching when I'm doing that, uh, thinking about things, testing things, you know, practicing things. So you're always trying to hone your craft. Um, so I'm never really turned off. Um, like when I'm taping a TV show and I'm doing that for 15 hours in a day, oh, I got to, uh, I don't really have a chance to think about my business, but I'm confident my business is going well because we have key, our key players are awesome. So putting the right players, having the right people around you, super important. Okay, one more question. Big Chris, you got another one. I know you got to get out of here soon. I'm, I'm, it's, not, it's not that I need to get, get out of here. What I was just asking you is how long so I can plan my day around it. That's, oh, okay. all, that's all I, I need. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm good for a while. You having fun? Yeah, this is great. Nice. I'm glad. There's a, what type of disciplines do you think that you've personally developed over the years have helped drive your success i know it's like totally a general like dramatic question but like a lot of people in the culinary industry want to get to the point you're at yeah uh i know and, and by the way I, i'm definitely successful and i know this but there's more, more people more successful than me what's really interesting is there's, there's plenty better chefs than me but aren't but don't get to be as success, successful as me so the question is why right i don't really know the answer but what I've learned, and one of the things I focus on is empathy and self-reflection. I've had a big learning curve opening up this restaurant. I went from having 20 uh, employees to 200 employees. And one of the coolest things I've had to learn is setting expectations. So my employees, when I walk in, they know what, I'm, what I expect. When I had that little restaurant, you know, we had a tight staff, maybe 15 of them were always there, and uh, five were kind of always moving through, 25% were kind of always moving through. Sometimes we'd have a big change, but usually you kind of kept people for a long time. So they knew what I wanted. It was like just kind of like the history of Tremont 647, and they all kind of worked together, and they knew what I wanted. When I walked in the door, when I needed something, I always had people around me. But as we now, now I shift to this new business with 200 people, setting expectations. So it's it's better for me because I don't have to walk in and be like, boo-hoo, I think I'm not getting what I wanted. So when I have an event or when I'm doing something, they know that here's the list of things that Andy needs. Here's what I, and I, you know, I spend some time and put it together so they can, so I can walk in and we can go, yep, there's everything I needed. You have it. Great. Let's go. Is there a certain type of like, how have you developed your multitasking skill though? Cause it's like, holy shit, your brain's got to execute and function on a bunch of different things every mm-hmm. single night, night and night out. Yeah, so, um, well, service is one thing, and service for us is day and night. So when I'm there, I'm present. I'm available for our customers and my staff. So, you bounce around locations. Yeah, I try to stay at one place for a week and move around like that. Um, but it depends on meetings and stuff. So being very present for my staff, um, you know, listening to them. Uh, so that's when I'm there. Um, but uh, others, you know, for me, it's my schedule and I just tightly plan my schedule. It doesn't mean I'm like every second doing a meeting or doing something, but it's like, here's a block uh, to answer emails. Here's a block to talk to my team. Here's a block to do this. So I block stuff. And most importantly, here's a block to be home. Here's when I'm going to be home. And that's what, you know, I, I my, you know, my wife and I really look at um, is to make sure that I'm, I'm home as, as much as I can be. I got some questions in my notes, too. Okay, bring them on. I did extensive research. I can't believe I blew it on that Jack Daniels thing. I thought it was 2018. Mm. Shoot. Did you just won some sort of award? I don't think so, but I'll take it. Hey, you just won the good guy award in my book. (laughs) Okay, yeah, so when you you kind of talked about doing a menu, Mm. how, um, how frequently do you adjust the menu, and how do you do it based on consumer preference? Like, is it a seasonal change? Yeah. So at, at the smoke shop, because we're a traditional cuisine, uh, we don't change much. We're always going to have ribs, brisket, pulled pork, that kind of stuff. Uh, we do change the sides seasonally and a couple appetizers seasonally. Are uh, the collard greens? They're great. Yeah, collard greens. Um, you know, right now, we just, uh, this is fall, so we just uh, put on the Brussels sprouts and 
customers are pumped because this is something they love. It's a, one of our biggest selling uh, uh, sides. So, yeah, you know, we you know we put stuff on. So now we I put stuff on and people aren't into it. So then I got to change it. That's fine too. But we try to kind of uh, for our new mini rollouts, we kind of just. Uh, um, focus on what the consumer wants, what they're asking for. You know, we get asked a lot for things. Why don't you have this? Why don't you have that? Um, so we'll put those on for them. And that sweet cake, baby boy, that thing was crazy. The what? That was a sweet cake, sugar cake. Oh, butter cake, butter cake, dude. Mm. Just like you're looking at this thing. You're like, Whoa. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's also <laughs> called uh, St. Louis ooey gooey cake. That's the, the real name of it. You're looking at this thing. You're like, dude, this should be a character in the animation. This, <laughs> thing. this thing is unbelievable. Yeah. So we don't change our desserts much. We have good desserts or solid. So, you know, with a barbecue restaurant, mm, let's say a steakhouse, uh, a pizzeria, you know, you guys could sit down and if I said, write me a menu for a barbecue restaurant, you'd probably get my restaurant about it, my menu about 80% right. Because we kind of have the same thing. It's a really cool brand. You know what it is. A steakhouse, you know what you're getting, you know. Um, when you're talking about Chef Chef Fred's, you know, American cuisine, you know, you're, I don't know what that is. You know, it's, it could be great, could be not, who knows, you know. So for us, branding is super tight on that. I, I didn't check, but have you guys developed your own barbecue sauce yet? Yeah, of course. So how does that, when you're conceptualizing the restaurant, you're like, okay, this, there'll be some cool products to sell that we could also create, or is that just as time goes on, you start developing things like that? Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure your question, but maybe I can answer it. Um, so, where, you know, I have recipes from when I was competing, and, and I've been cooking barbecue, so those are the ones I used for my restaurant. And then our barbecue sauce is just part of that. Um, if you're asking for bottling it, no, we, yes, that was my yeah. question. we, we may one day, um, you know, to be quite candid, um, it's not necessarily a giant revenue stream. It's great for marketing. So say to brand loyalty. Yeah. Of. It's and, and that's cool. And maybe one day, but right now we're really focusing on within our four walls. What would you call it? I'm not sure. We call, uh, we call it sweet victory right now. Call it. I'd call it the wedding. Andy husband to get it like the wedding <laughs> and it's like so would you go sweet or super hot well, we would do both we have um, uh, we have hot competition I think it's called and uh, uh, sweet victory sweet victory love it you know what you should get, do you ever watch hot ones do you know that YouTube show no it's like they interview celebrities and they have them eat like a range of 10 different hot wings you would do great on it you'd just be picking apart all the wings <laughs> well, that'd be awesome so, um, hey, for me, it's pretty much it. I had a okay. great time. Cool. Is there anything you want to get off your chest? No. <laughs> uh, no. Can you just give a quick synopsis of where people can find you, mm. maybe some of your social medias, and then where the restaurants are? Sure. So, uh, <clears throat> again, I'm Andy Husbands, pitmaster owner of the Smoke Shop Barbecue, Kendall Square, Seaport, and assembly row with a few more coming the smoke shop barbecue.com is where you can find us and me on social media at Andy husbands with an S pretty much everywhere. Hey, good. I can't wait to text chat. We got to text Jasper a pic and say, Hey man, look. All right. Hi, this is Andy. And that was my golden hour.